Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here, those of you who are here in the room and those of you who are joining us virtually. My name is John Rich, and I'm the director of the Rush Bemo Institute for Health Equity. And I'm extremely pleased today to welcome you to this conversation with Mr. Roy Martin. Thank you. I'm going to offer a brief introduction to Roy, and then we're going to engage in a discussion so that you can hear about his current work in Boston and across the country to address issues of youth development and youth violence. Roy, I've known for, Roy, what's it been? Over 30 years now. And Roy comes from a history of being deeply engaged in community in Boston, uh, then worked in the office of U.S. Senator John Kerry for eight years, directing constituent services. And then for the past 25 years, Roy has worked for the Boston Public Health Commission and now directs the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative, which I'll let him tell you a little bit more about um, in a moment. But I also want to just let you know that Roy over the years has had a profound impact on my understanding of violence, urban life um, during the time that I lived in, in Boston. And as a result of that, Roy is a subject of the book that I published back in 2009, Wrong Place, Wrong Time, really honoring the way in which I learned, we learned from each other in many ways about how to permeate some of the artificial walls between medicine, public health, and community. I'm a tidbit, a remembrance from when soon after we first met, if you will, if you'll permit me. Um, I remember the first time I met Roy, and about that I wrote, His eyes emanated a blunt honesty that matched his words and his voice. At that time, Roy had a don't give a damn attitude that I would see again and again as we got to know each other. At first, it seemed confront confrontational and daring, as if he were waiting for me to disagree with him so he could take up the challenge. But later, I would begin to see it as a reflection of his satisfaction with and his confidence in himself. It's, he seemed at that time resistant to judgment by others. Now, whether I have that right or not, over time, perhaps some of that may not ring as true. Um, but at the same time, I realized Roy is a person of strong opinions and perspectives born of his own experience. And so with that, um, I'd love you to talk about how you got here what the arc of your journey is, and then to tell us about the work that you're currently doing in Boston to address youth violence. Thank you. And thank everybody uh, for allowing us to appear today. I'm with my wife, Dr. Tia Martin, um, who probably could answer your question if those <laughs> character descriptions about me are true. Um, but I, um, how I got here, I, I met Dr. Rich at a, pretty much a mentor program as I was on my way home from prison. And I went to prison um, when I was 20 years old, um, for the most part, you know, speaking to the character and the rest. So I went to prison for um, a day where I am convicted of shooting seven people and, you know, all the associated charges that come with it, weapons, body armor. So, um, so I pled guilty, I did it. And 
you know, on my way back to the community, um, you know, I was mandated to go to a particular youth program. And Dr. Rich at the time was a mentor at the program. And I wasn't really participatory, like he mentioned. Um, because at the time, and just to give you some context, that day happened in 1990. Now, as you know, I'm sure some of you all are historians and this is the work you do. You'll see across America, 1990 was a different year in every major city across the nation. Um, and, you know, the young adult age population was dropping like flies. And so there was really no negotiation. It was no choose another option. I mean, and in my developmental state, um, it made sense to me to, you know, take my own survival into my own hands. So I wasn't really apologetic about anything and I didn't attack people that weren't on the attack as well. So when I came home and I went to this program, you know, that threat was still present. Um, in fact, I came home and it wasn't too long and I got back in trouble. I didn't go to prison, but you know, I was back trying to uh, take matters into my own hands or my defense into my own hands. But I met Dr. Rich and um, it was the first time I had met somebody who he was in y'all's position, um, almost exactly like, you know, and he was at Boston City Hospital at the time, now Boston Medical Center. And I did not believe that he was really in you all's position. I didn't know anybody black who was in you all's position. And so, you know, I was more curious about him than I think he was curious about me. It was actually an incident in a program where everyone left and I was the only person in the program. There was something was going to happen. And Dr. Rich stuck around and was like, what just happened? And we started talking. He was like, well, why are you talking to me? You don't talk to anybody. And I'm like, because you're the only one here. You know, and not like you're the only one present, but you were the only one willing to stick around. His curiosity. You know, so his curiosity, and I'm curious about him because I'm like, he's lying. Like, you are not a doctor. Like, you're too young. You know, there's no way, right? There's no way. And he said, well, you know, I actually have um, a particular challenge that I'm dealing with, with a lot of the young people that I'm seeing coming into the hospital. And number one, folks who come in often come back um, with a another injury or with a toe tag. And he was asking, you know, what are we not doing? What could we be doing differently? Um, and there's a disconnect. And a lot was around just the word sucker. You know, like folks are like, they'll kill or die about being described or characterized as a sucker. And, you know, just for the most part, a sucker is just a coward, you know, or whatever. And it's just like, you know, folks are very reactive to that phrase. And so he was like, why is it that serious? And I'm, you know, my thing was, we don't really have much else. Um, it was the first, when I first began to, um, I guess, be violent or take matters into my own hands is when I realized I was poor. Like I grew up as a kid, I never knew we were poor. In fact, I thought we were rich. Um, <laughs> Because we were just better off than most poor folks. So I was like, man, we're like, you know, the affluent poor family. Um, and so, but then when I realized, I was like, wait a minute, you know, like we're really poor, like we're poor, poor. And, you know, and then again, at that time frame, and it's just, you know, again, across the United States. Um, there was a drug explosion, weapons explosion, and young people started to access the trade themselves. Um, so, you know, for the most part, I, um, you know, once I began, and I was, you know, it's terrible to say, but I was actually good at it, 
um, that was the only thing I had. My identity, it was the one thing that I was like, you know, I had all the attention, I, you know, and so nobody was taking that from me. That's all I got. It's everything that I fought to achieve. And once I got it, I'm like, no. So when I met Dr. Bitch, it was the first opportunity I thought um, to actually be something else and, you know, create a, a, a different identity that I could be proud of. I just, you know, was like the first person again that was, you know, his humanity or his achievements were just like TV to me. And so I was like, I'm willing to listen. Um, and so I was equally curious. So thank you. That tell us how that landed you in Senator John Kerry's office. That's a funny story. <laughs> so and it speaks to your, your introduction. I um I always was a good student. I always was a good student. I loved school. Like I really enjoyed school. Um and in, in fact that actually contributed to my decision to just be a street kid. Um one year, you know, like when I realized we were poor, like it was a summer, you know how everyone has these summers where you stretch and you grow and you're like you know, I'll grow like three inches in the summer. And so I outgrew all of my clothes from the year before. And when the time came to go school shopping, it just wasn't happening. And I'm like, I'm going to school. Um, and I'm not going to school looking all raggedy. So I'm, I'm going out into the world and whatever. And so, you know, that kind of ruined school for me after that. Once I was like, I'm making money, I'm doing all these other things. It was like, forget about school. So when I get into the program and John Kerry comes, he's, you know, he's in a setting just like this. And all right, so this might sound bad, so forgive me, but there are times where someone like a John Kerry are coming to the room and we're all like black. And we don't really want to talk to him. Like, we don't really feel like he's listening and we don't want to look dumb in front of him. And so he's asking us questions and no one's saying nothing. And, you know, per your introduction, I'm like, I'll take it. I want it. You know, I want the problem. And I knew I wasn't stupid. You know, I was a good student. Um, everything we were talking about, I was definitely tracking the entire conversation and had some different disagreements. And so I wanted to debate. I was killing him. And so he afterwards was inviting someone from the program um, to take advantage of an internship. And so folks were like, yo, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. I'm like, I'm a government hater. I don't want to do it. Um, and they were like, you know, you kind of got group mentality, do it for the group. So I just went interviewed. I felt like, you know, I just wanted to land the internship and so i did i interviewed successfully and i walked out the door double doors like these and then turned around and walked back in and said thank you very much but i can't take this internship i actually came here from a pre-release i was you know i couldn't go straight to the community i wasn't getting parole or none of that so i was in a pre-release and i was just out on the pass so i was like look you know um so I'm pay for to say I was here, you know, I achieved what I wanted to, which was I successfully interviewed and got the position. And then they were like, nah, we want you, we want you to stay, come back. We'll talk to the facility you're at. Don't worry about it. We'll work it out. It was the U.S. Senator, you know, so they had the ability to work it out. And so I interned for a year, paid internship it turned into, which was cool. Um, and then things started happening again. So I kind of got low <laughs> for a few years. Got low meaning I went back underground for a few years and then we ended up reconnecting. So, but I did well. I mean, I worked in every department. Um, I was very good at the job. You know, when if anyone looked at his record during that time, he definitely didn't have the complaints that constituency uh, department uh, was very efficient. That's how I learned technically how to serve human beings. So, so it went very well. And then, you know, they were disappointed that I left. And once my current issues were resolved, um, 
I ended up going back and I was there for like seven, eight years. And so now you're working to, with, with support and funding from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, right. you've been working for years on how do we effectively intervene in the lives of young people to interrupt the cycle of violence. All right, so the program, I'm the, I'm the program director for three programs now. The um, a program called uh, Promoting Potential, which is 17 and under, and then the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative, which Dr. Rich is talking about, which is 17 to 24, and then the Men's Health Initiative, which I stole that name from you. You don't know that yet. You just found that out. It's free. There you go. <laughs> Um, which is 25 and older. And so the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative comes first. I've been uh, the director of that program for about 12 years, and it's interesting how I got recruited to work in that program. So prior to that, I've worked in the hospital. We'll get to that a little bit. But so there was a young man in the city of Boston who got killed, and he, he was 14 years old. And his name is like identical to my middle son's name. And so the family I come from, um, I come from a family where every male relative old enough to go to prison has gone to prison. Violence is just part, you know, it's part of just regular life. It's how we resolve conflicts in our family. Um, and when the young man got killed, I got a call and, you know, I was trying to explain it. That wasn't my child, but no one believed me, you know, because the, the young man got killed in my neighborhood. Now, my last name is Martin. There's like no other Martins in that neighborhood in the housing development. And everyone's thinking I'm like keeping it real. Nah, that wasn't my kid. And we're going to go on like a kid killing spree. And I'm trying to explain, like, it wasn't, it wasn't. My son, that young man went to the same school. Um, you know, my son was in the seventh, this young man was in the eighth. And so, you know, like many other young people, the homicide of that young man was, you know, it, it kind of rocked my son. So I kept him home, you know, to just deal with it. And every day there would be like a police car in front of my house. So one day I was dropping one son off and then coming home to be with the middle son. Um, and the, you know, the police car wasn't there when I left, but when I came back, it was there. And I was just, I was getting tired of it. And so I went upstairs and I got my son, and I brought him outside with his ID. And I'm like, that wasn't my kid, man. Y'all gotta stop, like for real, like, you know, and I'm thinking you gonna do something to me to, you know, deter. And I'm like, so y'all gonna figure out a way to lock me up or my brothers or something like that. So I'm like, look, stop. And they were like, well, you know, there's this meeting. Would you go to it? And I'm thinking I'm going to the meeting to explain to a bigger group of people, stop. That wasn't my son, you know? And when I go to the meet, <laughs> she's actually at the meeting, right? <laughs> this is long story, right? So this is weird, right? So my wife, at the time, worked for the police department. And I go to this meeting, she's doing a presentation. I'm looking, I'm like, yo, what you doing? Like, what is, what's going on, right? And there's like a big screen. They put all these names up there. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? Like, what are you? And they're like, you know, there's, there's this big police action that's gonna happen. I stopped writing names down. And they see me, I'm like, all right, I'm going to jail, I'm caught or something, or whatever. And they're like, yo, what do you do? Give me that paper, give them the paper. They tell me stick around to the end of the meeting. I'm like, yeah, they're cuffing me something, but whatever, I don't care really. Cause I was, I couldn't believe what I was saying. And they, they were like, you don't need that paper. We'll print it and give it to you. What was you gonna do? I said, I'm telling everybody whose names up there, what y'all are doing. And they was like, yeah, that's what we want you to do. So they're like, yeah, they printed it. They gave it to me now. Unfortunately, people who are active in violence often know other people who are active in violence, whether they, you don't like them or they don't like you. And then it's like young people. So I could look at it 
And I'm like, oh, I know whose kid that is. So I'm like, damn, I'm like, you're really about to wipe these kids out, right? And so I, you know, a lot of people, they didn't like me, but I'm like, look, this ain't got nothing to do with me and you. It's your kid. If it was my kid, I will hope you would do the same thing. So I tell everybody, I worked at the time for the commission. And again, my case management and all of that and how to serve people, John Kerry. So I was pretty good at it there. And folks start showing up at probation reporting and programs. You know, they're in something. So they called me back to the same room and they said, yo, we think we got something here. And they went to the governor um, and basically he funded it, you know, and said, you know, this is your job now. The mayor of the city of Boston was like, this is your job now. Just keep doing what you've been doing. And 12 years later, um, we think it's the approach because when you look at the nation, you look at Boston and you look at our decline in crime, shooting victims, pop one, every indicator um, through that period of time has significantly improved. And so hence the expansion of age range on both ends. But that's how I got introduced to that program. And that's what I've been doing. And, you know, I plan to retire doing that. And it's just, you know, it was a particular familiarity and comfort level um, because, you know, it was the same population that I am, not that I come from. It's like, I'm that, that everyone's not bad. Some people is circumstance. Poverty will change you in ways that no one understands until you experience it. And then you're like, damn, I did the same thing that I didn't think I would ever do. So. You know, so that it was a comfortable population and then there were a lot of lessons that I learned to improve my ability to serve humans. So, so tell us a little bit more about the ingredients of the program. What do you think are the key components of what you do right. that helps the young people that you come in contact with? All right, so there's no referral, like there's no, there's no open enrollment. I am not interested in engaging random young people. Uh, I'm only interested in engaging proven risk individuals, meaning there has to be some evidence of your risk. And for the most part, it's going to be prior uh, criminal history, usually firearm involved history and um, physical injury by firearm. So folks who get shot are probably likely to return the favor. Um, and when you get shot, you're likely to get shot again. You get caught with a gun, you're probably likely, you're the most likely person to get caught again. And in every city, like, all right, so if, if folks are familiar, like all y'all in gangs to me, as far as I'm concerned, right? And all of y'all know this to be true. In every gang, it's like the military, where in the military, say out of 10 individuals in the service, there's only one that's like in combat and the other nine are like support people, right? So when you look at gangs, you're wasting your time wiping out an entire gang because you're wiping out the, the dude you play Call of Duty with, the dude you go and, you know, go out and meet people to date, you know, uh, the dude who's just the couch you slept on. And there's only like one real violent person in that, right? So I don't need the other nine. I only want to deal with the one. And, you know, the, the, that's the criteria that we're looking at. And are you active now? Not were you active five years ago? Like, are you active now? So if you do you shoot or get shot? Um, and is there some current activity? So that's the criteria. And then in terms of what we try and do when we engage these individuals is, um, first of all, put their requests first, like that person-centered, client-centered um, approach where you're like, just tell me what you want to do. Because for the most part, when I, like short answer, what I describe I do to people is I'm in the time killing business. So the most dangerous period of time for young people is like 17 to 24, right? Motorcycles, all right? Like whatever it is, 
you know, all your thrill seeking, whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's like in that time frame, that's the most dangerous period of time for a young person. So if you can just kill the time, no matter what, it doesn't matter if you like what they want to do or not. I don't care if they just want to smoke weed the whole time. All right, let me get you out of this time period. So if you're in a time killing business, you just want people to be busy. So all I try to do is just get you as busy as possible. I don't care if when I meet you, you're like, what you want to do? I want to be a rapper. My mixtape coming out. I right, cool, whatever, right? You know, or and then other folks that use, it's like that clothing line. I'm like, it ain't never going, to, you know, but that's, you know, but that's what they want. Every, everybody want to do. And then it was funny. We were just talking as I walked up here where it's like, you know, and then once decriminalization and legalization of marijuana came up, everybody swear they're going to grow weed and be like, you know, Pablo Escobar weed. And I'm like, this, none of this is going to work. Right. But I don't care. I just want to kill your time. And then when I engage with people, I always, before I leave, tell them, it's like, all right, cool. Well, we, I'm going to help you work on this, right? I do have some ideas or some thoughts, but let's try your thing first. Then, you know, depending on how that work out, then we'll try, you know, my ideas. Almost every single time what they thought was a great idea goes the way I thought it was going to go. And then I'm like, because I've already built that investment, where they know I'm your partner, like, I, I'm not judging you, I don't care, or whatever, and I'm like, you know, I came through for you. I got you your little t-shirt press that you did nothing with, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, after that, they're willing to, all right, you know, let me try that thing you was talking about. And, you know, you'll find that there's two kind of persons who are violent. Um, one type is going to be an adolescent limited person, who you was just young, you know, young people do dumb stuff sometimes, right? And then there's a person who's gonna be life course persistent where there's something else going on. And that person is gonna be reckless and gonna be wild and gonna be super volatile until the day the casket drops. And so that's why I was like, all right, we need to figure out what are we doing with those folks? Because I know I'm not finished. The work's not done with this person. It's like we just disengaged at that arbitrary drop-off age of youth programming where it's like 17, 24. Sometime at 24, 25, we know exactly what we deal with, right? Disabilities and cognitive limitations and all this other stuff, they don't have expiration dates. They don't go away, you know? Like that's permanent. Right. And so what happens to that person once they 25? And if you look at shootings, murders, murderers, the most likely age almost across the nation is going to be like 30. So what then, you know, and so I'm like, all right, we need to figure out what we can do if we didn't have the opportunity. And this person spent this whole young adult stage trying to, you know, be Louis Vuitton, I'm like, all right, how do we stabilize the person so that they can move on and take care of themselves? And then, you know, in conclusion, um, the most effective interventions I've ever, um, I say witness or in my experience is relocation is number two. Just get away from the, you know, and then number one is a relationship, a loving relationship. Somebody love you, you know, and you love somebody back. It's the most impactful thing. It's the reason why people desist because there's something to lose uh, beyond freedom. Um, and then when you're in a, a healthy, loving relationship, some folks, they, you know, we crack on being a baby daddy. Some folks, that might be all they could do. And they will be happy if like, you know, I am contributing to the household, even if I'm disabled, I'm on, you know, some type of uh, subsidy or assistance or whatever, uh, SSDI or something, but I'm contributing to the household. You know, I'm going to pick up kids, you know, I drop off my wife and pick up at the end of the day. And if that's all they can do and that's what they do, they're like, oh, that's, that's cool, you know, like, and I just play Call of Duty 
all day with my friends and, you know, I'm not being violent. And so I think the missing link, which hopefully everybody in this room will fill the void you all will fill is at a certain point as witness here is that meaningful adult relationship. You know, I don't need anybody to be, you don't have to be a gangster to talk to me. Um, I didn't need a gangster to, you know, help me. Um, I already knew how to do that. Um, I needed help being something else and an adult, a meaningful adult relationship. Someone who, even when you're young, like he wasn't, he's not that far in age from you, you know, but the relationship, you know, it wasn't trying to be all hip hop and goofy. It was like, you know, no, he's trying to be like a big brother, like a real one, like a, what would a real adult say to you? You know, what would they coach you to do? Um, and a lot of us that have been in extreme disrepair, we just want to be around people. Some of us want rules. You know, we want someone to tell us like that was dumb to do. Sometimes that's a permission slip for me not to do it. Like hold me back in a fight and all of that. It's like, I really didn't want to fight. I needed permission not to fight, you know? So that meaningful adult relationship is the missing link. It's kind of ancient. It's not like this new cutting age thing. We need to kind of go back to some old things. I so appreciate that because in, in everything you're saying, I can I can see myself in that, right? I can you was in that. that. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the needing, like, needing, right. all of us can see, like, yeah, positive adult, a positive adult relationship is really what many times was really critical for us. Right. So it's not, it's not kind of, um, is exoticized, right? That right. the needs of the young people that you're working with are really basic and uh, human needs. I, I wanna ask you another question before opening up. I could talk to Roy for hours on end, and we have, right. but- um, 30 you know, years. 30 I mean, years, right. that's right. But, um, and I was goofy, I wasn't hip hop, but I was kind of goofy at that. Um, the, the, you, I've heard you allude to indirectly, in some cases, the role of trauma right. in the lives of young people. Can you talk a little bit more about how you approach that now and what you think we should be doing, and particularly speaking to a population of folks right. who are healthcare providers, healers, who are gonna be encountering people in various different parts of their lives? Um, well, Here's I want to answer your question, right? That trauma does not go away ever. It's not going away, right? I think the way to heal from trauma um, is you have to become much more than the traumatic incident, you know? And so when I'm working with young people, I really don't care whatever happened. Like, you know, my goal is to build more events, more uh achievements so you become more like one thing like all right say i'm the kid you know and there's some train station there here or y'all are gangbangers too and we noticed me and my wife was walking through here it was like y'all got a problem with um uic uic that's the ops for y'all right so it is we were look we was like yo let's, let's, yo I said, yo, they got the same colors. I know they they gonna throw it up on y'all when they see y'all, right? They gonna chuck it up on y'all like what y'all doing around here, right? So say you got slapped by somebody from UIC, right? Which is never gonna happen. Y'all the dominant set around here, right? But you could, you know, if that's all you were, ain't that the person got slapped by the, you know, that, that is that's going to be tough to walk with your whole life, you know, but if someone sees you, it's like, yeah, but I grew up to be, where's the queen doctor at? Down there. That, yeah, I grew up to be that. Yeah, you'll be happy to say, yeah, so what? Yeah, I got slapped. Yeah, I got shot. Yeah, this happened. Yeah, I was poor. Yeah, it was all that. But you know how much I've become since then? So the traumatic incident, like if that's all you are, you're in trouble, all right? Every young person, every human being, if that's all you are, that's the only thing you're defined by. 
So you have to become more than just that. And so I work hard to just keep building more and more, more and more, where it's like, yeah, so what? So you can say that. So what? Yeah. You know, but look what I went to become, the boss of Rush. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, so that's the thing with trauma. And then, you know, just understanding that trauma does, like nothing else, have a way to, like, instantly rewire a person. Um, so just keeping that in mind as we it's like, all right, well, we just got to build forward. We got to build upwards. We got to keep going with that in place. I can't change that. I can't undo that event. We can't unwire what just happened. So, yeah, that's that's my answer. That's, that. that's your answer. So we're also joined by Dr. Ted Corbin. He was chair of emergency medicine here at Rush. I don't know if everybody knows him. Anything you want to throw out there, Dr. Corbin? I'm just, just grateful for Roy and Atiyah and their experience and their words of wisdom. I think Roy has helped us shape what, uh, what we put in place in Philadelphia that pays attention to young people who have been um, victims or survivors of, of violence uh, seen through the emergency department, which is now actually happening here at Rush in partnership with some colleagues in the Department of Behavioral Health, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So, I just want to thank you because thank you. it's affirming to hear the story again to know that you know that there is there is life beyond um, that one initial experience and so we're going to capitalize on that with the patients that we see. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you all. Well, we want to open this up. We again, this is a conversation. We'd like to invite you in if you have questions or comments or experiences that you'd like to share. Please, can you, when you do, can you just say your name and tell us what your level is in the, or yeah. what you're doing? So, my name is Tyler. I'm an M2 here. And so, every weekend I kind of work on the west side and I work with a bunch of kids that range in ages from like middle school all the way up to high school. And kind of one of the concerns I have is these kids have like, it's one thing to say PTSD for adults, but these kids have like gone through things and there's no way that I can attribute myself to that. Uh, at their age level, right. that is, you know, something I can't comprehend. And I guess one of the things, though, is it's always the get back, you know, trying to like show that they can get their stripes, you know. And I'm trying to figure out ways to talk to these kids to get them out of that. Um, and I don't know, like, any appropriate measures to really go through to be like, it does get better, and here's the things to do for it. Um, aside from like building the relationship, it's just hard to orchestrate that to these kids. And I didn't know if you have any methods as to trying to teach these kids that you don't have to get back. You don't have to earn the stripes. You can just, you know, be better than the incident. Right. Well, first of all, good question. Y'all about to get my whole playbook here. I seen a hit record too. I was like, man, I'm giving it up. But, um, all right. So here's one of the things I try and do as well. Right. So. Success breeds success. And humans by nature, like, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it, but it's almost like copycatish and envious, right? So I try to spend most of my time trying to find a willing person where I could find a win. And it it's probably not, let's say, like the most developmental, like comfortable thing to say. Because you can spend your time on one human being, right, and achieve not much. And then you could spend your time on another individual and achieve a lot. And what's going to happen is the individual who wins, the person who didn't take you up on the offer, now he's going to be tight. The whole of, oh, whoa, wait a second. It worked for him, right? So it, it has to work for somebody. Just get that out the gate. And then folks are going to want to want what the other person got. Then the other thing is like folks are like brand name people. Tell me your first name again. I'm Tyler. Tyler. I had a nephew named Tyler too, so I, I shouldn't forget that, right? But um, folks are brand name. So they're going to want you. They're going to be like, oh, who, who got that for you? How'd you do that? Tyler? They're going to be like, oh, no, nah, I don't want his help. I want Tyler's help. So watch your capacity too, right? Because you'll end up. And it's going to work, I'm telling you. It's guaranteed to work. 
the worst of one person, other folks gonna want the same thing. And after that thing, if you're creative enough to be like, all right, I got another thing. And then folks are just gonna follow suit. Everyone's gonna be like copycat. That's how it works. It's like all things, everything you can think of, you can think of a million different scenarios that went exactly like that haircuts. One person got a haircut and that haircut was like winning for them. Guess what kind of haircut you going, you know what I'm saying? So just get that, you know, find the person who's willing to take it. You know, I don't judge people. I tell people all the time, today is just not the day, right? When they're like, man, I don't want to do that. I right, it's cool. I'm not offended. Maybe, you know, today's just not the day, maybe another day. Then I move on to the other person. So the door's still open. Um, and when it works with the other person, today's the day. Thank you. Uh, my name is Debbie. I'm a term one nursing student here. Um, I was just wondering if you look at the two kind of age groups, the 17 to 24 and then um, 25 and up, do you see a difference in the willingness of people to participate in the programs? Yes. And like, how do you deal with that or address it so that you can garner more, like, I guess, attention for it or willingness to be in it? The older crowd is way more willing than the younger crowd. Really? Okay. I assumed the opposite. Yeah, right. Good <laughs> question. Tell me your name again. Debbie. Debbie, all right. Um, the older crowd is way more willing. Okay. Right? Like, y'all all look like young people to me. So I'm, let me just assume I'm correct about that, right? There's something about young people. Young people just think you know everything. You know, you know better than your mother. You know better than the teacher. You know, and I mean, humanity needs that or else we never build planes. We never climb mountains. We, you know, young people do that, you know? And so young people are daring, young people are headstrong, they know everything. But once you're not feeling so young anymore, you're a little more willing to listen. Once you've had a set of failures and you get kicked in the pants a few times, you're like, it's the same. I play that with my clients. I'm like, all right, I have some ideas too. You know, and so we try your way, you know, young people, and it typically is like, that damn, you know what I'm saying? And then older folks, they've already, I've been through it. And the clock's ticking, you know? The clock is ticking where you're like, how long before I'm just an absolute failure? You know, and there's no other way to look at me. So it's like, all right, I'll take it. Like, well, I'll try it, you know? I mean, I know that's what scared me. That's what definitely scared me. It was like, you know, at what age am I just an absolute failure? You know? And so I was willing to listen. I was willing to take a shot. And then just like I mentioned, it was like, all right, you know, those wins I was something more, even if it's one more thing, it's like, well, I did get that job at Senator Kerry's office. You know, I did. So, you know, older folks are actually more receptive um, than younger folks. It, and there's not, nothing weird about that. That's young across the board. I don't care where you grew up, who you are, what's your culture. Young people know every daggone thing and don't know nothing. So, <laughs> sorry to disrespect no. all you young people here. <laughs> right. I'm just going to add to that that often, when you the older you get, the fewer programs are there are that are designed to help you. Right. You begin to see that the the pendulum swings to the criminal justice system right. as the place that you're going to uh, whose whose radar screen you're going to end up on. That's something we have to think about, right? To your point, we we can't only focus on, we do have to focus on younger people, but we have to expand that horizon. So thank you. Hey, my name is Andrew. I'm a second year medical student here. I'm curious how much emotional expression or lack of emotional expression plays a role in the work you do with these children when they when they come to you, they maybe have never had the opportunity to express themselves and express their emotions in ways that are maybe more skillful and um, helpful for what they've been through. So I'm curious, how do you encourage that and how do you make a space for them to be able to commit to that kind of selection and then, you know, improvement or whatever it is they want to move on? I, I think the emotion that for me has been the most effective is just really like authentic caring um, and like 
sense of humor, like don't take yourself too serious when you're engaging with young people. And so a lot of times young people, you know, they try you, they're going to say things, they're going to, and I'm like, again, I, right, you know, today just wasn't the day. Like when they have an explosive day, I'm like, ah, right, it's cool. I, I ain't mad at you. Today just not the day. Let's try this tomorrow. And then, you know, they see, they're like, all right, you know, he didn't weather, he didn't break. I didn't scare him away. And they become a bit more open. They tell you a little more. They let you in a little more um, because they know it's like, all right, so you really care. And then it's interesting, that question. Because one thing that I do that's worked very well is I follow people to jail. And it's usually, you know, you're young, you know everything, you know, whatever. And then it goes wrong, you get in trouble. And then when I pull up at the jail, like the shoulders, when they see me and they're like, yo, I effed it up, right? And I'm like, I ain't mad at you though. You know what I'm saying? I'm not mad at you. You didn't do nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, come on, man, we had a plan. We had a play, like, you know, so let's start. And don't, you know, don't start developing your plan with pointy shoes and onion head up in here. You know what I'm saying? Like, we had a plan, man. Come on, man, I know some folks in here. And they're like, yo, you know, it's almost like you really can. Outside just, I guess, with shakes hands well with caring. Um, I guess... I try to promote the sense that we're just all members of the same community, whether it's the reentry community, like being homeless is a community. Um, substance abuse users are a community. So a bunch of us, like, you know, we the, we effed up before community, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, I'm not mad, you know what I'm saying? So come on, man, what we doing? You know, like, yo, I know some people up here, man, let's finish that education thing. We got that plan. And they're just the thankful reaction, you know, like I didn't, I didn't give up on you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I still remember you, like this ain't just a program, you know, when you come home, I don't care where I'm at. My number hasn't changed in 30 years. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, yo, call me wherever I'm at. Sometimes it's just, you know, give you the answer on the test, like Dr. Rich and, and Ted, like, you know, it's like, all right, wherever they're at. You know what I'm saying? They'll pick up the phone and, you know, what's the question? Oh, I don't know nothing about that, but I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody and make this call. I'll tell them, you know, I know you or whatever. And I'm like, all right, that's all I needed. So behave like, you know, even if the community's a human family, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not a piece of trash. You're not that, you know? And I just, once you know a human, I know you. Like, you all, there's no way this is not going to happen to y'all. You know, like what happens if it's like you met someone and they were really banged up when you met them, like they were in a bad way. And then you see them again and you're like, yo, you know, like I know you. I remember when I, you know, we had to get your Mr. Potato Head self back together. And it's like, look at you, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, all right, it's hard not to care if you were a mechanic and you worked on a car and you're like, yo, that's the car I work, you know? And so it's like if that, person has a question, I think it's easy for a lot of us to be like, yeah, I'll answer that question. So approach like you actually care. And I think things change radically after that. Good question. Man. And just on this note, I think sometimes the there is a thing about masculinity that doesn't necessarily let you talk about being sad. That sometimes sadness is anger, right? Or or hurt is anger. And I, what I hear you saying is also modeling that for them, for young people that you come in contact with. Because one of the things I encountered, and you may see, is a lot of anger about fathers who weren't present. Or, and that anger is kind of sadness. And, and so um, we were talking about how earlier about how trauma can make it difficult for you to figure out, you know, what you're actually feeling, right? When you don't get right. a chance to name it. Right. You know, and so. I learned that from you, actually. Um, obviously, you know, you show up here to be classically trained and instructed on, you know, what folks who precede you knew or learned um, before you took the job. So you ain't got to figure it out. You know, you're like, all right, we're building on 
already established science. And so, you know, we used to go in there and we used to just see, all right, so let me take a step back. So one of the first components of our relationship is like he said, he's like, I'm working on this thing and it's just a lot I don't get. Like, I don't get it. And so one day he was like, yo, you should come to the hospital with me. And there's a young person that I'm working with. And, you know, we're just really stuck. So I walked in and I knew him. Like he was shot up. I knew him. And he's from the other side, right? And he just started telling everything to me. Yeah, it was your people that shot me. Like, da -da -da -da, and we're talking. And he's like, I don't get it. I don't get it. He's not talking to nobody here. And he just told you everything, you know? And I'm like, first of all, he knows I'm not going to tell on him culturally. I can't tell. Um, and he knows I didn't do it. And a lot of this stuff is not personal. You know, it's just my friends don't like your friends. And when we see each other, we got to you know, it's not something has to happen or else I'm going to be shunned. So in either case, um, Hello. Right now, did y'all get him on tape? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we was talking about that earlier. We're like, yeah, that we're going to get everybody that show up. Um, so, you know, that's how I showed up. I had no classic ed classical education. I had none of that. Right. And we just used to fake diagnose people, right? We, he got PTSD. That's what he's going through. And we're like, that, he's like, that's not how it works, man. And I'm like, how you know? How you know? You never even met him, right? And he was like, um, there's certain things that are supposed to happen. They're regular. Like, it's everyone's experience. Like, and, you know, in this period, in the first 30 days or the first week, the first whatever, everyone's supposed to be shook up a little bit. You know, you're supposed to be still, you know, shaking. You, it's not strange to feel like every other person you see is one of the people that did something to me and things of that nature. But beyond 30 days is when you can begin to say, all right, if certain things don't go away, we might have to diagnose. So that being said, there's certain things that, that you benefit from if you explain to the patient and normalize the experience, you know? So I, this is not funny, but my culture, some stuff funny, right? So <laughs> one of my prior clients that we both know, um, and another client, it was like a severe lightning storm the night before. And we couldn't find either one the very next day. And everyone's like, what happened? They didn't show up first. That I, they were enrolled in my program, then they eventually became employees, and now they're like big shots now, right? Um, and everyone was like, they didn't show up, they didn't, huh? And I'm like, well, I almost didn't show up today, right? So they're like, why? And I was like, they might be over there aching and in all type of pain based off their injuries and certain feather patterns. Your injuries start hurting, stab wounds and start itching, broke bones and start aching, right? So there's certain things that you have to describe and normalize, like, you know, this is just regular for everybody that goes through this, you know, and you're not weird, you're not strange, you're not bugging out or losing your mind. Like, if it's like, yo, I'm seeing things, I saw something, it's like some of this stuff, like, everybody go through that, and they're like, so that's regular? Like, yeah, you're not bugging. So they're like, all right, and they calm down, and it's like it's a lot more likely that someone goes on and heals up, and they're a little more accepting of the experience they go through and can even predict it. You know what I'm saying? It's like looking at the weather forecast, it's looking pretty bad. It's like, you know, might have some aches and pains, but it's not weird. This is going to go away. So really trying to prepare folks, you know, for what they're going to experience after their situation. You know, even like long term healing, you know, say if you severe, severe injuries, explain to people what that journey looks like. You know, explain to people like, you know, most of the folks that we've seen recover, this is what. So it's like, all right, they can plan for it. They can project things. They can kind of establish a timeline in their progress, lack of, but really explain, let them be a partner in that. And, you know, assume that they could understand and, you know, be a partner as well. You're not 
you know, the only one that can know. Make sure you teach them as well. So one more question here, and then I'm going to ask you, because we're about at time, yep. just to end by telling us what do you think healthcare providers need to do, to know or to do, to be a part of this solution? Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Nick. I've been at one here uh, in the past. I saw someone that came into a clinic that had a gunshot wound in their eye because of gangbanging, and they were kind of past the point of like looking for their get back. Is there a part of your organization or any other organizations you know of that kind of help people put the pieces back together after something like this? Like they're not necessarily violent at this point. They have kind of felt the repercussions of that lifestyle, but they don't have any network to turn to to fix what happened. Um, I would have to say that that will be an area where we certainly lack. Um, and I think all of us as providers, we need to be comfortable admitting where our gaps are. Um, and that I would say is funny. It's a great idea about what area we could potentially expand. But here's the challenge, right? The challenge is without using the, the example of the individual who's kind of like, you know, now the incident took you offline. Groups don't work for my clients or the, the demographic I'm looking for. Not like groups are not effective. They shouldn't be in groups together. Um, so there's something called, usually in youth work, what they're going to call is deviant peer influence, right? It's not smart to put a bunch of people who are active like this together. It becomes like the Olympics of goonery, you know? For real, it's like everyone's trying to outdo each other and, you know, dry chump each other, you know, establish your dominance. And, you know, and in certain cases, what would happen is you're going to mess around and there's going to be some collaborations that I've made that mistake before. Um, and I was like, we ain't doing this. That was bad. Like, I screwed that up. And I'm willing to admit, you know, where it's like, we messed up. Um, you shouldn't have put these. You know, we're thinking because they ain't beefing that they could share program space. Not for a certain tier of individual. And so, so that's very difficult. We got to figure that out. Um, but uh, again, the group that I'm really trying to connect you to is almost like a group of one. You need a relationship. You need someone that love you. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's just, is there auntie someplace? Is there, you know, a family? Um, first of all, they know way more about you than I know about you. And this other group is going to know about you. And you don't got to perform for them. You know what I mean? You could just be yourself and you could be their relative. So it's really like trying to reconnect folks back to the community they actually come from or build that community in a form of, uh, you know, a beneficial, loving relationship, um, which is where we all end up at a certain point. You know, we stray away from the group and you end up and it's just two people. And that's really who you end up with. So it's hard, but there are individuals um, and not just to live, but it's almost like to share, you know, learned experiences based off the recovery. So I think that's what you're asking. Thank you. I think that's our a great place to leave the conversation cool. for now. All right. all right. I just want to invite all of you. Thank you for being here and invite all of you to thank. Thank Martin you. Martin. Get yourselves around. Thanks for being here. Just remember that this afternoon, Dr. Tia Martin is going to be in conversation talking about her expansive work. Um, that's all I'm going to say. I'm the expansive. I'm the opener now. That's, <laughs> I'm the opener. <laughs> um, and we'll be in Route 500. We'll also be virtual, and so uh, we look forward to those of you who will be back with us. Thank, Thank you again. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thanks. 
Awesome, man. Awesome. Wow.